us all day. Okay. I wish I wish we had days of the week. The one that had an H, one that started with an H, one that started with a C, because then we could have HTML Wednesdays and CSS Saturdays or something. I don't know. But we're going to focus on CSS because we learned a good amount of HTML. Not to say that there isn't more to learn, but um, we've learned enough to make a reasonable web page. Right? We can put text on it. We can put headings on it, headlines. Uh, we can divide our page into sections. We can put links. We can put images. You know, a lot of web pages have just that. All right? But where a lot of web, web pages are different is that they, they have a lot more substantial formatting than we've been doing. So that's really what our focus is going to be, definitely for this class and, and probably into next week as well. All right, because we're going to hit CSS and we're going to hit it hard. Uh, chapter 9 uh, in the book for next week is an important one. We'll get into some of that stuff today, but we will uh, um, also get into it next week. Let's refresh our memory where we're at. We were creating a prototype for our page on the history of rock and roll. And let's review the steps of the prototype, all right? Because I think I mentioned them last time, but I, I want to make sure I review them explicitly of what we're going to do. First thing we're going to do is make a template of both the HTML and CSS code. All right. The idea of a template is with a template you have code that you can then clone and copy to make all your different pages. So for example, in our history of rock and roll, we have, I don't know, eight, nine different pages. All right. We're not going to create eight or nine pages from scratch. We're going to create one page that has a lot of the common stuff in it, a lot of the stuff that's going to be on every single page. Then we're going to copy that, and we're just going to change the section of the page that's different. All right. Now here's where CSS has the advantage, right? Because when we clone this template, we're going to end up having six or eight or nine, however many, HTML pages. So step two is to clone, and we're going to have eight or t however many HTML pages. But we're still only going to have one CSS file, right? So that's where CSS sort of has the advantage, because if I decide I want something different in the layout of the page or the appearance of the page, I don't have to go back and change 10 HTML pages. I change the one CSS file, and boom, all the pages are reflected, all right? But what I do want to make sure is that template contains all the common code, all the common HTML code that I'm going to need. And I want to be pretty sure about that, all right? Because after I clone those 10 pages or however many pages, I'm then going to finish up the individual pages. do that then if I decided, oh, there was something else I wanted in the header, then I have to go back and change all 10 copies of that page. All right? So changing HTML, we're going to have to change in every copy. Changing CSS, we only have to do in one place. So I'm actually going to be, how do I want to say this? I'm going to be more careful about getting the HTML right. Because if I get that wrong, if there's something that I forget that I have to have on every page, then after I've cloned them and customized each individual page, then I have to go back and redo all the individual pages. Like, for example, if I forgot my email address in the footer, for example, and I said, oh, I really need the email address in the footer. Well, at this point, it's in one place, so that's easy to change. At this point, it's in 10 different places, and that's going to make it harder to change. Again, I don't have that problem with CSS. All right. I don't have that problem with CSS because all the CSS is all in one place anyhow. So if I decide, gee, I don't like that color blue, I want a darker shade of blue, well, I just change it in the CSS file, and I only make the change in one place. All right. Now, looking forward past this class, um, when you start learning server-side scripting techniques, if you go on and continue studying web development, and you learn server-side scripting techniques, 
then you won't have that restriction with HTML either because you'll be able to put common code someplace. And again, depending on, depending on the specific language, there's a different place to put it. Um, but you'll be able to put common HTML code someplace, and then if you have to change it in a bunch of pages, you only have to change one file. In ASP.NET, for example, that would be a master page. In PHP, that might be an include file. But that's looking forward. That's looking forward beyond the scope of this class. But for now, HTML, there's going to be one HTML file per page. CSS, there's going to be one for our entire site. Um, at least for now. All right, so let's look to see where we were at. Here is our prototype, our, uh, the template that we we're developing. All right, and I would say there's two things that I want to do here, at least two things with this. One is um, I want to uh, orient the links horizontally instead of vertically. Right now, they sort of take up a lot of space being oriented horizontally. I mean vertically. If we, if we change it to be oriented horizontally, they can go across like this and everything will be okay. So that's the one thing that we want to do. The second thing we want to do is we want to spice this up a little bit, right? This is rock and roll. This is not the Wall Street Journal or, or for a funeral director or something like that. This shouldn't be a boring site. Um, a guide for the design of a site is, you know, simply put, a serious site should look serious. A fun site should look fun. All right? You can fill in any adjectives there, you know. Um, your appearance ought to go and ought to match sort of the content of the site. All right, so we notice that with ACDC versus um, Barbie. Barbie site looked Barbie-ish. ACDC site looked ACDC-ish. All right, now there, there's, there's a few exceptions for that. When might we not want our site to look like what it actually is? When might we want our site to look one way when it's actually another way? There's one exception that pops into my mind instantly of a site that looks one way, but it's actually something else. Any thoughts? Well, there was one that we talked about, the I like bees one, where you're throwing a person a curveball and you have it looking that way. But I'm thinking of another sort of site in addition to that. Anyone fans of The Onion, the, the humorous website that has humorous news stories there? That site is meant to sort of have the appearance of a serious news site, but it clearly isn't. It, it, it publishes satirical, humorous pieces, and therefore, but, but they don't make it obvious at a glance that it's humorous. So much so that, that especially in the past, before The Onion was well known, there were people that actually mistook The Onion for an actual uh, uh, news source. If I remember right, uh, the Korean leader, um, the Onion Post, uh, uh, you know, made some uh, statement about him and the Korean leader cited it, the North Korean leader cited it as, as though it came from a serious news source, uh, which, was, which was pretty funny. Um, at any rate, keep in mind those are exceptions. Um, I point that out only to say that most of the design ideas that I talk about are guidelines more than cut and dried. But we can talk about certain sort of defaults. And a default is, is a site ought to look like what it is. You know, a site for a lawyer ought to look like a site for a lawyer. What if you went <laughs> to a site for a lawyer, for example, and it was all done in bubbly colors and there was animations of pinwheels turning round and stuff like that. It wouldn't give them a lot of credibility. Uh, by the same token, if you went to the My Little Pony site and it was done in black and white and looked like the Wall Street Journal, it wouldn't be much fun for the visitors of the site. So another thing that we want to do for this is we want to make it fun. All right. So that's going to be job one and two today. Orient that horizontally, make this a little more fun. All right. Um, what we'll do after that then is we'll start cloning these and I'll, I'll make at least a couple copies. I won't necessarily copy each individual page, but I'll do at least a few of them. And we'll talk about some more uh, CSS techniques as we do that. All right. 
how do I orient this horizontally? Any thoughts? I'm going to pretend I don't know how to do it. All right? Which at 9.15 in the morning, when I have a headache, isn't that hard to pretend. All right? Because I forget stuff. First of all, and, and I'm going through this because I think it's important to understand the thought process that you go through. Because I can, I can show you how to do this specific thing, right? But the point isn't to learn how to do this specific thing. The point is to understand how to change web, web pages in, in general, right? So the first thing I'm going to decide is, is, is this a CSS or an HTML change, all right? And in this case, these are a list of links. So the UL tag, which this is in, is the correct tag. So an answer you may be tempted to say is, well, don't make them LIs. Just make them regular links. All right? And that's not horrible, but I think we can do better than that. Because this really is a list. This really, really, really is a list. So therefore, um, I want to keep the HTML matching what the content actually is. So this is really a list. So I want to just change the way it looks. Ah, change the way it looks. That ought to set off an alarm in your head. That means a CSS change. So if I want to change what the content is or means, that's an HTML change. I have this text that I want it to be a link. Maybe, for example, down here for my email address. I have that text, and oh, I want it to be a link. Well, I'm changing what that content means. It's no longer simply a block of text, it's a link. That would be an HTML change. Whereas, I have a list, and this sure enough is a list. I forgot the end UL tag, but it is a list. I want that list to look a different way. Ah, look a different way CSS. So. Now, question is, is do I change the UL or the LI? Because those are the two tags I have going. And I'm going to try Googling CSS UL horizontal. A horizontal list menu. They do it a little bit different way in that example. All right. Here's the key element, the display element. Remember I said there's two kinds of elements in HTML. There are block elements and there are inline elements. Block elements are what? They're things like header, footer, section, nav. They stack up like blocks vertically. Inline elements get put in a line horizontally. So what I want to do is LIs are block elements. They stack vertically. I want to make them stack horizontally. So I essentially need to change it from a block to an inline tag. All right? And the way you do that is with the display property. You can change any tag to behave some other way simply by saying display inline or display block. And there's actually uh, another possibility, display inline block, that we'll talk about in a second here. All right? So, I'm going to go into my CSS code. And I'm going to say, li.
display inline. And when I do that, they are oriented horizontally. But you have to trust me on that. All right? Shouldn't trust anyone. Don't even trust me. Especially don't trust me. So let's look at the computer. There they go. They're oriented horizontally. All right. And what I did to do that is I went and I put an LI display in line. All right. Now, it accomplished the goal, but is there something that you don't like about this? You look at look at it. Yeah. Kind of scrunched together. It is. All right. What did we learn last time to put space between things? We learned something last time to put space between stuff. Pardon me? Well, we could we, we learned border, we learned width, we learned padding. And we learn margin. Now, any one of those might work here, but let, let's look at those closer and try to decide what we want to do. All right? We could actually do a couple things to, to fix this. Sometimes, you know, sometimes there aren't right or wrong answers. You know, there, there aren't absolutely right or wrong answers. Sometimes you can do the same thing a couple different ways. But let's look at what those those attributes do. We learned width, border, margin, and padding. And maybe something else. I don't know. All right, let's start with those. If I have a block, these work with block tags. The width, the border, is the border around it. The width is the width of the content area. So I could make that 100 pixels, let's say, or 50 pixels. The padding is the space between the border and the content. And finally, the margin is the space between this block and its neighbors. All right? So we actually could use a couple different things to do this. We could use width. We could use margin. We could use, uh, we might be able to use padding, and we might be able to use a border. We might be able to use a combination of these things. So let's go on this track. The first thing I'm going to use, or try to use, hint, hint, is margin. Because what was the statement? They're, they're scrunched together. So what does the solution seem? Put some space in between them. Well, what is the attribute to use to put space between things? It's margin. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put margin of 5 pixels. By the way, keep in mind that these things add up to make the total width. So if I have something, this is one thing I want to cover before we move on to the next step. If I have a width of 100 pixels, and a padding of 10 pixels, and a border of 1 pixel, and a margin of 10 pixels. How wide is this total thing? Well, it will be 10 plus 1 plus 10 plus 100 plus 1 plus, or plus 10 plus 1 plus 10. So that would be 2142. 
So in other words, the border, the padding, and the margin add to the total width of that box. All right. So the width is simply the width of the content area. And then I add to it. It's the same thing with percentages, except the percentages, the actual value is going to depend on, on how wide the screen is. All right. So that's something to keep in mind. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a margin of, how do I want these to look? Well, maybe spaced out like this. If these are the little boxes for the links, maybe I want 10 pixels between them. So I'm going to, and, and then I, I don't want any space on the top. So I'm going to say for this, for my LIs, I'm going to say margin 0px, 10px. Now what do those two numbers mean? Again, you're going like a clock. 0px on the top, 10px on the right, 0px on the bottom, 10px on the left. It would be equivalent of doing this. This would be the exact same thing. All right? And again, you're going like a clock. Zero on the top, 10 on the right, zero on the bottom, 10 on the left. Now when I do this, I'm going to tell you this right now so you're not surprised. This ain't going to work. All right? And I lied. It did work. Well, what do you know? What do you know? Let's try this in another browser. Uh, wouldn't it, have worked? Um, it would not have. I did not expect it to work because um, margins only exist on uh, block items, and I made them inline items. So let's try a different browser. That's something that we want to be sure that we start testing. The more that you start doing with CSS code, um, there's a risk of browser incompatibility. <laughs> Here's the case of browser incompatibility right here. We'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, we have a lot to talk about. Well, yeah. <laughs> or edge, for that matter. Um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know, I think I know what the problem might be. Let's try this again. This is actually covered in the book. I'm going to leave this for now. All right. Uh, we'll come back to this later on because there's some, uh, typically when you talk about differences in browser behavior, um, everyone else works one way. The Microsoft browsers work a different way. So there's actually a section of the book that talks about what you can do to fix this specific problem. But I really don't want to talk about that right now. Let's try Firefox. And if, if, if I don't have the problem in this one, I'm going to give up. Well, I'm not literally going to give up. I mean, I'm not going to like walk out of class, but we'll go on to the next topic. Right, I didn't think so. Well, good. I'm glad you didn't think so. Okay, it works in here too. All right, good. All right. Um, what I expected is I expected them to be smashed together, and the solution of that would be to make it inline dash block. Let me see if I can put a border around them. All right, I'm able to do that. 
Um, see if I can put a width on them. Okay, with 60 pixels. All right, this, is sh this might be showing the problem that I was talking about. Notice I gave a width of 60 pixels and the width of that didn't change. That is because I made it an inline tag. If I make it inline block, then it will change. So I was wrong about the border, but the width is definitely something that has to be a block tag to show. Make it a little wider, not that wide. Okay, there we go. All right, not bad. So I guess what I was saying was correct. I was just mistaken about a border. You can, or um, yeah, uh, um, margin. You can put a margin on any tag, but a width has to be on a block tag. Or you can say it's inline block, in which case then you can put a width on it. All right. So if I just say inline, I can't put a, uh, a width on it. If I say inline block, I can. All right. I'm going to take this off. All right. I'm going to play around with the links a little bit. All right. I'm going to get rid of the border because I don't think the border really adds anything. But what I might want on my links is a hover effect. What do I mean by a hover effect? I mean if you put your mouse on it, um, something about it changes. First of all, it should be clear the way this is set up that this is my navigation. All right, it's pretty obvious that that's the navigation. All right. Therefore, I might be able to deviate from the default of the browser. What's the default of the browser? To make it blue and to make it underlined. So I might be able to deviate from that. So let's go in and let's play with the links. I'm going to make the link A. I'm going to say text decoration none. The autocorrect is doing me in here, but I'll go and change it. Text decoration, none gets rid of the underline. Color, I'm going to make white. And background, I'm going to make gray. All right. So that's how my links show up. I'm going to put some padding in them for good measure. And what does padding do again? It puts some space between the edge of the block and so that looks a little nicer. All right. I might want to do a mouse over effect to let people know that these are links. All right. So what I can do is I can do this. This is what's called a pseudo class. For links, you can specify states of that link. In other words, an A is simply that link appearing on the page. So I could say, that's what this is. This is a link all the time. I could also say a uh, hover. And hover means that the mouse is pointing to that link. 
So what I can do is when it hovers, I can go and I can change it to have a a background color of white, let's say, and a color of red. So I put my mouse on it, it changes to be like that. I can also put, in addition to that, I can put A colon visited, um, A colon active, um, A colon, I'm not sure what the, I think there's one more. But the most popular of these would be hovered and visited. We haven't created these pages yet, so we'll ignore the visited for now. Now, did you notice something? Not only did these links change, but this link changed. Now, I very well might want the links in the navigation to look different than the, link, the links elsewhere on the page. Right? But, look at our CSS. Our CSS simply says A. And what does that mean? That means any A tag on the page. It would be nice if there was a way to say, I don't want every A tag anywhere on the page. I just want the A tag in a certain section to look a certain way. So, in this case, which links do I want to look like that? These links, the links that are in the nav. All the rest of the page, I want the links just to look the way that they were. All right? just the way that they were. So, I can do that by saying, changing my CSS a little bit, to put nav in front of the A. Oops. Now, what does this mean? That means that links within the nav section in the nav section, change all the A tags. In the, A, in the nav section, change all the hovers for the A tags. So we're refining what we're changing with the CSS. All right? If I do this, or if I do this, or if I do th um, that, I'm referring to any of those tags anywhere on the page. But if I do this, I'm saying only the links in the nav section am I going to change. And the links that are in the nav section, I'm going to change this way. So if I make this change, then these links look like this. This link looks just like it did before. Okay? Uh. This is giving us more control over what we apply our CSS to. All right. We don't have to change every tag on the page. We can select specifically what tags. Remember, these things, the stuff that appears here before the first brace, is what's called the selector. And so far, we've been using just the simplest selector that there is, just an HTML tag. And when you just use an HTML tag, that means anything that has that tag on the page will get changed. All right. Whereas if we can refine our selectors, we can say only specific things get changed. We don't want to change every link. We just want to change the links within the nav section. So this gives us greater control to sort of fine tune our page the way exactly that we want it. Now I could do something like this. This is going to illustrate what's called the um, cascading part of cascading style sheets. I'm going to say something like this. A. Font size 
1.1 amp. What does 1.1 amp mean? I think we've talked about amps before. What does amp mean? EM. Short for emphasis. So 1.1 emphasis means it's going to be 1.1 times bigger than it normally should be. It's going to be 10% bigger because 1 amp would be just its normal size. 0.9 amp would be a little smaller than normal. 1.1 amp is going to make it a little bit bigger than normal. So if I do this, the question is, is this going to appear on all links? Is this going to appear only in the links in the nav section, or is this going to appear on only the links that are not in the nav section? If I say A, font size, 1.1 M. Let's see. All right, what happened? Actually, all the links got bigger. All right. Why is that? Well, it's because of the C in cascading style sheets. Cascading, you think of cascading, it like you can think of water going down and touching all the rocks as it goes down a waterfall. All right, you start at the top and you go down to the bottom. You can have multiple style rules that can apply to any, any tag. Any tag can have multiple relevant style rules. And here's the way that it works. All right. If I define a style rule for all the tags on the page, so if I uh, define a style rule for A's, then all the A's on the page get the style rule. I can then override that style rule for specific A's on the page. So for example, for this, whoops, and this, I overall rule the default. Let's go and let's make the color of these um, let's make the color of these pound sign nine nine. Zero 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 zero. Oh no, let's yeah, yeah, let's do that. Nine nine zero 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 zero. What color is that approximately? Red. Red. All right. Is it a bright red? Not really. All right. If it was FF zero 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 zero, it'd be a very bright red. But 990000 is a, is, is a medium darkness of red. So I've given a color of these for 990000 and a font size of 1.1M. So let's look what effect that has on the page. It only changed that one. Why? Well, because of the way it cascades, the way the style sheets cascade. I've defined this as the rule for all links. So all links get this rule. The links in the nav, I've sort of overruled that rule by specifying no. I don't want the color of red, dark red for that. I want the color of white. So this is sort of more specific than that. This says all links. This says links over uh, in the nav section. So if I have two rules that apply, the one that's more specific to the tag takes precedence. So color of white defined on for all links within the nav section takes precedence than a color of dark red for the A's. All right, for all the A's on the page. All right. Where there is no overruling, for example, my style rule for, there is no style rule for font size. for navs. So therefore it gets the font size from this rule. So in other words, if you're going to look at these links here, 
these links get the font size from the A, to, uh, the A style rule and the other attributes from the nav A rule. That's sort of the cascading part. So any tag on the page can actually get some of its appearance from one rule, some of the appearance from another rule, and furthermore, some of its appearance from the default of the browser. Let's get rid of text decoration none. I didn't say anything about whether it should be underlined or not. But the default rule of the browser says that all links are underlined. This is an important example to, to, to cover, all right? And this is an important example to understand. So take a minute to look at it after class, all right? And if you can understand why all the links on this page look exactly the way they do, then you probably have this down. All the links on the page, first of all, there was browser defaults. So that's why they're underlined. All right, because it's default behavior of the browser to underline links. All right. And since my style rule doesn't say anything about underlining, they all are underlined. So I've not overruled that de browser default. All right. Now the default rule of the browser also says that they're blue. Well, none of them are blue. So why aren't they blue? They're not blue because I've overridden that. I've said that all links are dark red. All right. So this one's dark red. I then have specified that these links in the nav section have a background of white and a color of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, a color of white and a background of gray. So. I've overruled, I've overruled the size, so it's still, so all the links in the nav section still get the size, but the links in the nav section get its color from the nav style rule. This is really showing sort of the power of developing uh, these CSS rules. You want to spend some time thinking about them to do it in sort of the simplest way possible. All right. Um, so you want to think about like how do I want everything on the page to look? Do I want things in a certain section to look different? And so on and so forth. All right. I'm going to pose a question to you. All right. And we'll see if we can think of the answer. Let's say there's a list in the article. Let's say in the middle of the article I say Popular bands include the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. I want you just to think to yourself how this is going to look. So, I put in this is a section in a paragraph, I put an unordered list. All right? Here's the style rules that we have. So, think in your head what it's going to look like. It's oriented horizontally. All right. Links are typically to be oriented vertically. Or lists, I'm sorry, are typically oriented vertically. Why are these oriented horizontally? 
because I have a style rule that says list items are normally block items, but change them to be inline block items. What could I do to correct that? Exactly. I could just change this to say nav li. So what this will do is li's within the nav section, this rule will apply, but li's outside of the nav section, um, I'm not changing the defaults at all. All right, so therefore, whatever the default of the browser is, that will be the appearance. So that would correct the problem. And sure enough, there we go. All right. Let's see if there's anything else I want to talk about before we move on. Again, learning CSS is learning both of these things. Learning how the selectors work and learning how these attributes work. Both of them are key to learning how to write good CSS. Learning how these selectors work allow you to pinpoint specific things on the page. Learning how these attributes work allow you to change whatever things that we want to on the page. And then remember how the cascading part works. All right? So that you can potentially have several rules that apply to a given element and a rules defined on one level and the more specific rule will then override um, the less specific rule. And everything overall rules the browser defaults. Of course, if you don't address something, then the browser default, default takes hold. All right? Questions? Let's look to make this look better, more exciting. All right? Because, of course, you know, we could work on this forever, right? But we, we have to move on at some point. But I don't want to leave it like this because this looks pretty boring. All right? How can we make this look a little more exciting? I am going to make a couple of changes here. I'm going to change the width of these guys temporarily. We'll talk more about percentages going forward, but for now I'm going to make this fixed size. All right, just so those fit going across in one line. All right. And right now, if I make it smaller, I don't know what I just did. There we go. It still stays at that size. All right. What can we do to make this a little exciting, more exciting, make it look more rock and roll? Is Times New Roman a very rock and roll font? How do I know it's Times New Roman? That's the default. All right, so that is that. So I could change the font. What would be a more rock and roll font? I don't know. Let's see. Comic Sans. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Too late, you said it. We're doing Comic Sans here. Okay, So. I could go in and I could say body, font family, comic sans,
When you specify a font, you always specify multiple fonts. Any ideas why you do that? Did I talk about this already? All right. When you specify a font, you always specify more than one font. The reason for this is that any individual machine may not have that font loaded. So you could be working on a real old Linux machine. You know, not you working on it. I'm sorry. I, uh, let me rephrase that. Someone visiting the site may be visiting the site on a, in a really old Linux machine that doesn't have the Comic Sans font. Well, you get to describe what font they should use. So what will happen is the browser will start and try to use the first font. Try to use, and if, if it has it, fine. That's what it uses. If it doesn't have it, it goes to the second font. If it doesn't have it, it goes to the third font, and so on down the list. The last font on your list should always be sans serif or serif. All right. What is a serif? Well, this is where a picture is worth a thousand words, I think. A serif is a little thingy on the end of a letter. All right. Let's go into Word and play with fonts. Maybe we'll find an even better rock and roll font than Comic Sans, but I doubt it. All right. Here's a font called Arial. Alright, here's a font that is called Baskerville Old Face. These little thingies on the end of the letter, like this here, this here, this here, are called serifs. So fonts, generally speaking, are one of three kinds, all right? Serif fonts have those thingies on the end of the letters. Sans serif means without serifs. Sans is French for without, all right? And so notice that there's no little thingies on the end of the letters here. All right? Um, so a serif font, a sans serif font. The third kind of font is what's called like de fonts, and those are fonts that are like Comic Sans, where they don't, they sort of follow their own rules. All right. Let's look. And we can test these fonts out. The only thing, again, is remember that any individual machine might not have it. Here's Comic Sans. A lot of people make fun of Comic Sans because it kind of looks, it's kind of meant to look like friendly and fun, but, you know, if you're doing it for your kid's third birthday party, it probably will fit the bill, but for a more serious website, typically it won't. Of course, Rock and Roll isn't really a serious website, so I don't know. Uh, there's one I just saw a minute ago that might look good. Let's try Cooper Black. I kind of like that one. That's kind of 70-ish rock and roll. All right, so we could possibly use that one as well. There you go. Yeah. What kind of font is easier to read? Serif or sans serif? Any guesses? Correct answer. It depends what you're talking about. All right, you can't give an answer like that. Generally speaking, many websites use serif fonts for larger text and like headlines and use sans serif fonts for smaller text. So for example, if we were to go to Wall Street Journal,
notice well, it's, all is pretty much sans serif. Oh, well, no, it is. It's, oh, I'm sorry, it's all pretty much serif. These aren't. Um, generally speaking, at smaller font sizes, because those little doodads um, at smaller sizes sometimes don't look right, a lot of times people use uh, serif fonts for uh, large fonts and use sans serif for like the body of an article. So sometimes you could do that. All right. Um, so that's actually not a bad combination. You use a serif font for headlines. Si yes, serif font for headlines, a sans serif font for like the body of articles. So you can make, maybe, maybe make your H1s, H2s, H3s a serif font and make the paragraphs sans serif. That would be a good strategy. How many fonts should you use on a page? It's almost like colors, right? Remember, we're using these fonts to sort of help the reader organize and understand and read the page and make it legible for them. All right? And we also use fonts to indicate that something is different. All right? So if you have a whole page of sans serif text and you have a paragraph that's in serif text, that stands out. So you can literally make everything on a page a different font, just like you can make literally everything on a page a different color. But when you overkill like that, you end up cloudying your message instead of making it more, more clear. So use these things judiciously. A couple fonts is probably enough. Just like a handful of colors is probably enough for a typical website. All right? Any thoughts, questions on that? All right, as far as this goes, let's go and let's make this guy Comic Sans. Maybe this browser doesn't recognize Comic Sans, which I find hard to believe, or maybe I have a small spelling error in it. <sighs> Thank you. There we go. Now we're rocking. All right. Now it's possible we could go to, say, a Mac, and if we were to view this page on a Mac, they probably don't have Comic Sans MS on it. They probably don't have Microsoft fonts on it. So therefore, um, it would get the, the next font on the list. You can search, and you can find like fonts that typically are used together. And, this is a, and you can also get a sense of like what fonts are typically available on certain machines. And that's, that's a good thing to do as well. The other thing I would do about this is I would say we need a background image on this. All right? So let's find a big old guitar. All right? So let's go and let's look for guitars. There was a, you know, we could, we could find a real, like, rock and roll guitar that has, like, five necks on it or something. That would be really cool. Let's go and do an advanced search here. Ah, 
Actually, we don't need to do an advanced search. I want, a, I want big ones. And I want ones that are Creative Commons license. Kind of like that one. All right. Let's go with that one. I'm going to go and save the image in my folder. I'm going to change the name to guitar. And I'm going to paste. I'm going to save it. I'm going to copy this link into my HTML because I want to put a credit on that for that. Another thing that you typically do, by the way, when you cite a web source, like if I say I got this from a certain URL, is I specify the date that I retrieved it. That's sort of common. And that's even common like in, um, what's it called, APA style, like for a term paper or something. Um, if you like cite a web source, you put the date that you retrieved it. Right? The reason for that is, of course, web pages can change. And you're able to put a citation on there, and a person looks for it and say, hey, that, that quote isn't on that page. Well, if you specify when it is, you could actually use the Internet Archive to go back to an earlier version of the page or whatever. So I'm going to add on here, retrieved today's date, which is June 22nd? Uh, yes, I believe so. Well, we're going to pretend it is if it isn't. Okay. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to change my CSS to say background. URL. Remember, that's how you specify it's an image. You put the path to the image in there. And now our page looks like this. It's good except for one little bitty problem. Can't really, can't really read it. Hmm. What could we do to fix this? Well, we could go into an image editor and fade that image out so that we have sort of more like a watermark image. The other thing that we could do is we could uh, put uh, a background color on that and set the opacity. So let's try that one. I'm going to put on my four elements, our, our, yeah, my, my different elements of the page, I'm going to say background white. Opacity zero point five is what? It's half see through. The bigger the number, the more see through it is. Is that right? Yeah. Or is that no? That's not, that's not right. The bigger the number, the less see through it is. So the more solid it is. Yeah. Notice, by the way, I don't have to so specify literally everything. I just specify the things that I want to change. So I don't have to say the list or the length given opacity. Those are all contained in the nav and the header and the footer and all that. So that should take care of everything. And now we have that. 
And, well, I don't know. Do I like that? Maybe. We could make it a little more solid. Maybe go up to 0.7. See what that looks like. Yeah, I think that's a little more readable. So we'll go with that for now. Again, we could play with this forever, right? Now here's a nice thing. Well, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. One last thing I want to look at this before we move on. Notice this paragraph down here. This paragraph down here is different than any other paragraph on the page. All right? Why is it different? Because it's, it's my credits. It's telling people where I got that image from. All right? What is a rule of design? Well, things that are the same should look the same. So all these links in the nav look the same. That's a good design, right? They all look the same. So the user just assumes that they're the same sort of thing, right? It'd be really weird if you had where this was a link, this was just text, this was another link, and you had them all look the same. The user sees things that look the same, they're going to assume that it does the same thing. It means the same thing. Well, here's a paragraph down here that's different than everything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of set that off a little bit. All right, I'm going to sort of set that off so it's obvious that this paragraph is different than all the other paragraphs. All right? Now, could I put a style rule for paragraphs here? Could I set it off by saying... background black color white. I could, but watch what happens. Wow. Changes all my paragraphs. Wow. And that's not what I intended. I just want to change this one. Okay? Could I say footer P? Now that's, that worked with the links and that works with the lists. What if I say footer P? Well, it changed both of those paragraphs. And that's really not what I wanted to do. I wanted to change this and only this on this page. So what do we do? Well, the answer to that question, again, relates to selections. All right? Selectors in the CSS. We've looked at a couple different selectors. One of them related to the HTML tag. Another related to an HTML tag within another HTML tag. But none of those are going to work here because I have two paragraphs within the footer and I only want to change one of them. We have two alternatives for a situation like this. One in, in which alternative we use depends on whether we expect there to be more than one paragraph we want to look this way, or if we know for a fact that only one paragraph is ever going to look this way. In this case, I can pretty much guarantee that I'm only going to have one credits paragraph per page. I'm not going to have credits in a couple different places. All right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to set a rule based on an ID. And we've talked about IDs before, right? When we talked about linking to a specific section of the page. All right? So, how do you use an ID? I can put an ID in the HTML. And I'm going to say ID equals credits. Now, for me to use an ID, there should only be one thing on the page that has an ID of credits. Right? Remember, ID means identification. Identification means that, you know, your student ID shouldn't relate to more than one student. There'd be a problem if it did. Right? Who would get the bill? Who would, who would get 
credit for the class, who gets the degree, you know. It wouldn't work that way. Therefore, an ID needs to uniquely identify something so that only one thing has that ID. And then I make my style rule to use that ID. And just like before, when we use the ID in a link, we use a pound sign first. So now we have a different selector that says anything on the page that has an ID of credit is going to get this style rule. So now when we do that, then only that one paragraph gets the style rule. So yay. yay. We've, we've accomplished pretty much everything that we wanted to do on this page. All right? And again, we could work on this forever, all right, make it look better and refine it. But I think this is a good point for us to move forward. And what are we going to do? We're going to go and we're now going to clone this to make different copies of the page, all right? In other words, I have a page that should be named index.html. I have a page that should be pre-50, 50, 50, 60, 70. I'm going to go and copy some of these, all right, and we'll customize these. So I'm going to go and I'm going to save my template as index.html. Actually, maybe I'll do all of them. Not that many of them. Save it as index. I'm going to put in here an H1. This says home page. Now I'm not going to do all of them. I'll just do a few. So I'll save it. I'll save it again as pre-50. I'll save one for the 1950s. And then I'll save one for the 1960s. Now that I've started cloning these, I can pretty much get rid of my template, right? Because if I need to go back and change anything, I've now made copies of that, and we have to change on every page. If I realize that I spelled my name wrong, I now have copies of it, and I'd have to go back and change it on every page. So the template I could pretty well delete. I'm going to keep it around just for good measure. But now what do we have? We have our home page. We click on the link for pre-50s. We go to the 1950s page. 1960s page. Notice how, because these are all clones of each other, notice how like nothing on the page changes for this part because that's common code. The only thing that's going to change is eventually we're going to go and we're going to redo this. All right? We're going to go and, and do this. All right? For each page. All right? Now these I haven't cloned yet, but you would do them essentially the same way. Now again, before I did that, I better have double checked to make sure that there was nothing I wanted changed in the HTML. Because if there was, then, well, I have to go back now and change them in all the clones. Of course, there's something I need to change in the CSS. That's okay. Like, for example, maybe I don't like a black background on this. Maybe I want to use uh, a dark red background on it. Well, I can change that in the CSS. And 
because there's only one CSS file for all the pages, that gets changed on every page. Or, well, I want a little padding on that. Put a little space between that. It's a general rule. You almost always want a little bit of padding just to, um, so things don't run right to the edge. Now there's a little bit of gap between there. Now what we'd do, we'd go and we'd complete all the pages. All right? We'll go and we'd complete all the pages. And by completing it, I mean we would go in and change the content for those specific pages. All right? So let's go and do one of them. Let's go and change the 1960s. All right? So I'm going to open up the 1960s page. I'm going to get rid of my Greek text. All right? Because remember, that Greek text is only a placeholder text. We don't want that in the final version of any of these pages. So on all these pages, we'll get rid of that Greek text, Greek text and we'll replace it with some real text. So let's say I'm going to put some of the top albums from the 1960s. All right. So I'll put an H2 and say the Beatles. And we'll put two of the Beatles albums, because I like them a lot. Um, I'm going to put a short paragraph here. And I'm not going to put a lot of stuff in here. I'm just going to put, not Greek text, but just a placeholder. Here is info about the band. Here is info about the album. Here is info about the album. And I'll put another band's info here. All right. So let's pretend that there's bigger paragraphs here. I'm going to go and save it. And I'm going to go look at that page. Okay. Not bad. 
But here's something that I'm thinking. Remember I said, I think I said it in this class, that one way that you can test a design to see how good it is, is to squint your eyes or unfocus your eyes or take your glasses off and look at it and see if you can tell the organization of the page without being able to read the words. So I take my glasses off. It's not obvious to me how that's organized. In other words, if you look at it, there's an organization here. Here's the page header. Here's everything about the Beatles. Here's everything about this album. Everything about this album. Here's everything about Jimi Hendrix. Here's everything about this album. We could do well to organize this page so that at a glance, we could see everything that belonged together for a particular band. All right? It would, be, it would be nice if we were able to do that because that would help the users visually organize the page. And likewise, everything about Jimi Hendrix. So, like things should look alike. Different things should look different. All right? Sections on our page that we, we have, we have sections of this page that relate to bands and sections of this page that relate to albums. Are we only going to have one band on a page? No. Are we only going to have one album on a page? No. So we can't use IDs. We could, but that would be awkward because we'd have to define an ID for Beatles, an ID for Jimi Hendrix, an ID for Rubber Soul, and so on down the line. We want all the bands to be treated the same, and we want all of the albums to be treated the same. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two classes. Classes is when you have sort of related sections of the page, where you have sections of the page, but unlike an ID, there isn't one thing that gets that ID, there can be several things, however, that belong to the class. Just like in real life, right? There's several people that belong to this class, all right? There are several people, uh, you know, that are of the class of Lorain Community College students, several people that are CISS majors, and so on. Now, your ID, there's only one person that has an ID. But when you start talking about classes, you're talking about groups of people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two sections, or several sections on this page. Can I have a section within a section? Absolutely. Or, since this is more like an article, I'm going to call these articles. I have an article about the Beatles. I have an article about Rubber Soul. Notice how I'm in Denning, so I can easily see what is nested within what. And then I have an article about Abbey Road. I'm going to put these article tags in. They're not going to do anything at first, but they will start doing things when I start adding styles. An article for Jimi Hendrix. And an article about his one album, Are You Experienced?
All right, if I go and view this now in the browser, guess what? It doesn't really do anything. Remember, these are just grouping things. They're really going to have their value when we start applying styles to them. So, no visible effect. All right. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to put class of band on the two sections of the page or the two articles on the page that are about a band. I'm going to put article of album about the sections of the page that relate to an album. All right. Still doesn't do anything. But now I can put style rules on those things. <laughs> So, for example, I can go in and put a style rule of, it's not pound signed band, pound signs for an ID, it's dot band. And I can do whatever I think is right for that. Um, let's just do something simple like putting a border around it. So I'll say border 1px black dotted. And we'll see how that looks. I don't know if it'll look good or not. Now, it doesn't look bad. Let's make the dots bigger though. There we go. Um, what don't I like about that? Notice how it's right up against there. What's the fix for that? Padding. So I can put in that band section everything has a padding of five pixels. That gives it a little bit of space. Notice how Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles run up against each other. So they are. All right. What could we do to fix that? What, is spa what do we do to put spaces between things? Notice those dots are right on top of each other. We could put, for spaces between things, we could put a margin. So I can say margin Ten px. That puts ten pixels in between it. That puts a little space in between it. Now, one thing you might notice: I put a margin ten pixels, right? What direction is that? It's all four directions, right? Because I only put one number: top, right, bottom, left. Notice this though is only ten pixels. That's known as margin collapsing. Here's the idea. When you say a margin of 10 pixels, you're saying it can't be any closer than 10 pixels to its neighbor. All right? So if I say there's 10 pixel margin on the bottom of this and 10 pixel margin on the top of this, it doesn't add them up and make them 20. It says, okay, if I make a 10 pixel space between them, then this is 10 pixels away from that, and that's 10 pixels away from that. So. 10 pixels between the two of them satisfies both conditions. So margins don't add up. It just makes sure that the amount of space is, is there that you said you want between there. It doesn't go and add them up. So now if we take the test of taking off my glasses, all right, I can see that this stuff and this stuff are two different sections, that they're somehow related. That's why we do these design things, not just to make it look better or to, you know, to, to add whatever. Um, we do it to make our page organized better. So people at a glance 
can understand the way our page is laid out. Now, because we put this in a style rule on our CSS page, guess what? Every single page is going to have this scheme. So when we get to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on, anytime we put a class of band, it's going to put that border around it. So our users, our users will begin to understand that dots around it is a section for a band. We don't have to tell them that. They'll just know after they've seen it a couple of times. All right? So the way that we can use these visual elements to emphasize the organization and structure of the page. Now, I didn't have to use border, right? I could have used a background color or whatever. But group it in some way. Again, the art of design is figuring out what's the best way to show that. I'm going to change album. I'm going to put in a class for album to be a little bit different. I'm going to use a different background color. Background of, let's say, six Ds, which is going to be a shade of gray. It's going to be a light shade of gray because Ds are high hexadecimal digits. But it's not going to be as, as light as white. Oh, that shouldn't say band, it should say album. And I forgot to put the class of album on Abbey Road. Now we take our glasses off and look at this. We can really get a sense of the organization of the page. The dotted borders go around a group of things. These are each things. We know just by use of convention and classes that whatever this is, it's the sort of same kind of thing as this is. Because we made it look the same. Same things should look the same, different things should look different. We also know that this is the same as that, right? Because visually it looks the same. We're sort of teaching our users about our site by giving them these subtle visual cues so that any place they see it, they'll understand what to do. Questions about any of this? We went over a lot of stuff today. I will post these examples and take the time to study them and bring the questions you have to class on Tuesday. Your design is coming up soon. I don't remember the exact due date, but check the due date on that. Okay. One nice thing about this, and we'll talk about this going forward on Tuesday, is if you're developing a prototype, you can actually create a couple versions of your page. Now that I've created the uh, HTML and the CSS for this, I could create a second version of the page that looks entirely different than this. And I could show it to whoever I'm doing this site for and ask them, which one do you like? Do you like this one? Do you like this one? And they can make some good, give you some good feedback on that. We'll do more CSS stuff next week. All right? See you over in lab. See you in lab.